Uh, tonight I think it's going to be a, a really nice evening. Neil's going to uh, tell us a lot of stories and things that he remembers uh, growing up here and going to high school and playing with the tunes and, and playing the drums and probably just a little bit of everything else too. Uh, so I'm not going to I'm not going to waste any more of your time on that, but, re but do remember the museum. And if you haven't been before, if you'll pick up one of those envelopes that are in those baskets by the drum, we sure would appreciate it. Thank you, Neil. Well, thank you so much. This is indeed an honor and a privilege for a local boy to come back to his hometown of Mendham, which I dearly love and be able to talk about growing up in men. Now, I don't think it gets much better than that. <laughs> anyway, my wife was asking me, she says, <clears throat> well, where are you going to start? I said, well, I'll start at the very beginning, and then I'll take some detours. <laughs> well, we don't want to get a lot of that stuff. But anyway, I was born July 19th, 1937, in Mendon, Louisiana, at the Mendon Sanitarium. We all know where that is. Not call that anymore, of course. Uh, the attending physician was Dr. C.S. Sintel. Yeah. Yeah. The attending nurse was Mrs. Olga Sawyer. My mother always used to tell me, she said, you know, while I was up there in the hospital giving birth to you, across the hall was Doris White, Mrs. Walter White. She was yeah. giving birth to Jeannie White. <laughs> <laughs> we all know Jeannie. And so that, that was something that uh, I thought was, was very interesting, you know. And, and so I, uh, when, we, uh, uh, when I got out of the hospital after being born, we uh, were living on 2nd Street. That's the street just over on the other side of the 1st Baptist Church parking lot, I believe, it's over there. They had uh, some apartments over there, so we lived there until we had a home that was built over on Buchanan Street. The house was built by Turner Brothers. That was Sidney and, and uh, Bobby. They, they built homes all around town, and they were building over on Buchanan Street. That's where uh, we lived. I lived there my entire life until I got up went to college and moved to Texas. So that's where we lived our, our entire life was over there. So, but later on, I guess we all remember that down on the corner of Jefferson and Chandler Street is where Ms. Nelson had her kindergarten. That so many of us went to kindergarten down there. And I've got a picture over here. I'd like you to look at it later on when you get a chance. I think you will remember a lot of these kids that were in there. And in fact, I've got a copy of it right here. Now I'll go through some of them. There's a, uh, a young man here in this picture. He's He's uh, got rabbit ears, and in front of him, his name is Earl Edmondson. And he lived on Buchanan Street, down where I think uh, the, uh, the McGowans lived in there, I believe is what their name is. I'm not sure exactly who that was. But anyway, Earl McLean's dad was a military physician. And uh, so that's where they lived, uh, down the street from us. Anyway, in this picture, when you look at it, you're going to see some. You'll see on the front row there are three clowns there. One of them is Rob Martin. One of them is a boy named Jacob Konoski. The other clown is uh, James Allen McKay. <laughs> Next to James Allen sits Sally Sintel. I don't know the other little girl. And on the front row there are three sunflowers. One of them is Edward Kenham. The other one is Jimmy Fitzgerald. The third one was William Emmett Ward. And I don't know who are these other two little uh, boys are. So you go up to uh, the second row, and these little girls have on these long dresses. The first one over there is Sandra Bullock. I don't know who this other little girl is. That's the little girl I had to ask for. I don't know who she is. And next to this little girl is Jerry Malone. Next to Jerry Malone is Anita Baker. Next to Anita Baker is Jackie Batten. Then you get on the third row, and there's a couple of girls up there. I don't know exactly who they are, but Linda Leah Mims is up there. She has a crown on. Mary Winford, she has a crown on. And next to Mary is a boy named Marshall Owen, Marshall Owen Pennington. Next to Marshall Owen Pennington is 
Turn on Ed Brown. <laughs> Next to him is a boy named Jimmy White. Now this is not the Jimmy White of Doris and Walter White. This Jimmy yeah. White lived down the street from the, from the school there in a big two-story white house. I think it was next door to the Stewarts, Dan Stewarts, and, and Pierce has lived on the other side. That was Diane and Gerald Pierce there. I know that to be a fact because my brother dated his sister. Her name is Lanier White, so that's who that Jimmy White is. And the next little boy is yours, Trumy. And then another little boy, his name is Hill. I don't know what his last name is. But anyway, when this picture was made, I guess this was made for our spring recital that we uh, would, would have each year. And this is made on the steps of the Menden High School. And when the picture was made, well, we all went inside and we got up on the stage and uh, we had to say a poem. Well, Ms. Nelson was right behind the curtains. She was there to make sure if you forgot what your words were or your lies, she was there to help you. So we, uh, we set a poem of some sort, and everybody walked out with their uh, costumes on. And at the end, the, the little boys that had the, there was, there was uh, five of us up there, and five girls, and the little boys, we had white shorts on, and white slippers, and, and, uh, and a cape. And we, they had a maypole. They had this big pole that was out in the center of the stage, and they had these pink and white Great paper streamers, and they go all the way up and down. When they, they they had these streamers out here, and what the streamers were, each of the little girls had to get one of the streamers, and the little boys we had to stand there, and they grabbed their arm, and we marched around this maypole. I don't know how many times, five or six times, and that's all we did. It was a maypole, and we marched around the maypole. And why did we do that, Ed? Do you remember? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that, that, that was the pretty much the, the kindergarten trip that we had there, you know. So anyway, like I said, we lived on McCammon Street, and on both sides of where we lived, Rob Martin lived on one side, and on the other side is where Jerry Grigsby lived. And there's been other people that lived in that house beside Jerry Grigsby. That's Grigsby's left, I think. Uh, the McKinnises lived there for a while, and uh, then the Baileys lived there, and I think the Paces might have lived there. A lot of people lived in that house over there, but while we were living there, and, and Jerry Grigsby he was, I think, probably a year behind me. He was in my class, pick seven. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I remember Jerry. So anyway, Jerry had a dog. This dog had had a litter of puppies, and one afternoon, there was a big shade tree out between the two houses, and, and so the dog was out there with her pups, and we were out there looking at the dog and um, admiring them, and, and someone was pushing a baby carriage up the street, so when they got to where the puppies were, uh, I didn't think this little child in the carriage could see one of the puppies, so I reached out to pick up a puppy to show it when I did, the mother dog bit me right there. <laughs> and so I didn't think too much about it. <clears throat> Until it was time, I guess, <clears throat> for my Saturday night bath. <laughs> my mother was in there and she looked at my hand and she said, What happened to you there? I said, Oh, Jerry's dog bit me there the other day. It looked pretty bad. So she immediately, uh, after this, the bath taken was over, she called uh, Ada Grigsby and she said, Ada, do you know that Jerry's dog bit Neil? She said, no, I didn't know that. But she said, anyway, the dog had been acting funny all week, and the dog died. So, uh, anyway, whoa, people started getting, getting real anxious about that, you know. This is probably, the dog probably died on Wednesday or something. And it, I guess almost a week had gone by since this dog bit me. So, anyway... Well, they started stirring around. So the next afternoon, uh, Warren Grigsby, my dad, Willis Baker, uh, and, they, and there was a doctor they kept thinking about. I think it might have been Dr. Godfrey. And he was the parish health director. If he was there at that time. They all came out and went to the back of where Mr. A.A. A. Pope was living. That's where they buried the dog in. It was a kind of a cane patch. It was a patch between... The, where the Popes lived and Dr. Banks lived on 
over on Elm Street on the other side there. So anyway, they uh, they dug this dog up. Uh, they removed the head and they put it in a surf bucket. I'm sure it's a clean surf bucket. There was a state trooper waiting out front. So I read Larry. They took this specimen out, gave it to the state policeman. He took off to Shreveport. There was a plane waiting over there. They had to take this specimen to Baton Rouge to get it analyzed for rabies. They didn't do it in Shreveport at that time. Well, anyway, this took a long time, and I think 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning they got a call, and they said that the dog had rabies. So that meant I had to start taking a series of shots. So the Grigsby's, they said, well, since it's Jerry's dog, and I'm sure the dogs licked Jerry all in the face, they said, we're going to have Jerry take the rabies treatment too. So whether you know that or not, that's 18 shots in the stomach. That's every day. You don't miss a day or anything. You go down there and you have those shots. So anyway, the parents got to decide, how are we going to get these two boys to go down and take these shots every day without them crying and screaming and kicking and raising all kind of fuss? How are we going to do that? So they set us all down. They said, boys, y'all going to have to take some shots and tell us how many. And they said, if y'all go down every day, take your shot, not fuss about it. When you get through with your shot, you can go to the sports newsstand and get an ice cream cone, a comic book, or if you want to go across the street to Morgan and Lindsay, you can get a toy. Oh, boy, you go, hey, that was all right. We, as bad as it hurt, bad as it was, we never uh, cried or, or fussed about that. And the doctor that uh, gave that, he was down in the Centel Clinic, and his name was Dr. Eugene Rogers. He had just gotten back out of the military. And the Rogers lived across the street from the, from the high school up there. If you remember where, where they were, they had uh, a, a, Eugene's sister's name was Emma Jean Rogers, and she married Red Conkright. You remember Red Conkright? Okay, that's, that's who his, his wife was, but Red Jean Rogers. And on the corner, I think, was where William Ambrose lived, and across on those apartments, Miss Foray lived down over there. Spent many a night uh, over there drinking coffee and visiting with her. And uh, going back to uh, from, the, from the community house, I won't go back over there, going up toward Elm Street, over on the corner over there was where Lewis and Jean Scruggs lived. Uh, I, Lewis played a lot of golf. I don't know what he did for an occupation or anything. And his wife, Jean, worked for the Chamber of Commerce. That's when the Chamber of Commerce was located right around the corner in the fire station on the top floor. And J.C. Salmon was manager at that time. That's who Jean worked for. When uh, Mr. Salmon was appointed, I guess, director of Caney Lake and left, then Brody Pugh came in as manager of the Chamber of Commerce. Had a, had a son named Charles Pugh. We were good friends. And, uh, so, and then the next house, that's where the whites live. That's where Jesus White lived. <laughs> Boy, have I been to the birthday parties over there. And so the next house on the corner was where the Richies lived. And they had three sons. The oldest son, I think, was named Shelley Richie. And then there was Ed Richie was the middle one. And Andrew Richie was the just the youngest one. They had five sons. Five? Yeah. Okay, I don't know the other two. They were up and gone. Were they? Okay. Well, if you remember, I think Shelley married Louise Carson, who was the older daughter of Marshall and Margie Carson. And the younger daughter, Patsy Carson, married Leonard Lyle. Leonard was the older brother of Bob Lyle, and Bob Lyle married early Mendenhall. <coughs> that, that's how that all came together. So, uh, anyway, like I said, the, we survived the rabies, Jerry and I both, and, and that, that was really good. So, uh, the next thing, do y'all y'all remember when Hollywood came to Menden? Okay, boy, was that a big deal. I remember I was left inside of school, and we all congregated down in front of the old courthouse, and Boyle Drug Store was over on one side, and then the other side, there was a dress shop, I think. So we got down there, and about at noontime, 
we waited and we waited. Uh, I, get, I don't have to go back to school that afternoon or not. Well, we were there to get to see the Hollywood actors come in. So here comes <clears throat> the fire truck. <clears throat> Excuse me. Screaming down Main Street. It stops. This <clears throat> young actress gets off. Her name is Julie Adams. Now, if you've never seen Julie Adams, if you watch Andy Griffith reruns, last Friday night she was on that very show <laughs> giving a shot to a uh, tetanus shot to somebody out in the country. That was Julie Adams. That was the lady that got off the fire truck that came to Menden with the movie stars. So behind the fire truck there was a, uh, a truck pulled up, there was a bus pulled up, it opened the door, out stepped George Murphy and Frederick de Cordova. He is a movie and TV producer. So that, and I guess we have to be, we all made over it and they shook hands and they got on the bus, headed off towards Shreveport. That was it. We don't know where they were. <laughs> that was a big deal for us to see that. <laughs> and then another time I remember, I uh, was walking downtown, got up to the Rex Theater, I believe Edgar Hens and his family, his office was back in the back. They may have lived in the Rex Theater back there they for a did. while. I think they did. they did. But anyway, Edgar Hens comes walking out to the front and he comes over and he says, I said, me? He said, yeah, come over here. <laughs> so he came over here and he says, young man, I want you to do something for me. There may have been somebody else too. I can't remember who it was. Was it you, Don? Could have been, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, Frankenstein was making a personal appearance in Minden <laughs> now. So here comes, walking out, of, eight feet tall, I guess, really Frankenstein. He had these chains on both of his wrists. And Edgar says, would you and your friend do me a favor? Take these chains and walk Frankenstein down Main Street. And we said, yeah. <laughs> so we, we walked him down Main Street, you know. I got down as far as uh, Portion Winfrey's dress shop, I think. Ms. M. O. Powell came out. She said, Neil, what are you doing? I said, I'm walking to Main Street. Frankenstein down Main Street. So we walked down to the end of where the, uh, down on the corner below the Lawrence C. Scruggs's. Then we crossed the street, walked all the way back up on the other side. Of and people were honking and looking, and they had no idea what was going on. But that was quite an experience. I thought I enjoyed that more than anything, I guess. And then there was a summer when uh, a lot of the merchants got together. And for X number of dollars you spent, you got a ticket. And this ticket that you got, you could take it up to the Rex Theater. They had a big... Uh, cylinder thing up there that you could put these tickets in. There's two tickets. You kept a ticket, you tore off the ticket, and put it in the, this big uh, container up there. It had wheels on it. And so they were giving away prizes. <coughs> One month during the summer, it may have been June, on a Tuesday night, I guess there were four Tuesday nights, they would have this giveaway and they would pull a ticket out of the big container and whoever had that lucky ticket got the prize. I can remember three of the prizes they were giving away. They gave away a Stromberg Carlson portable record player. They gave away a Westinghouse roaster, one of the big things that you put turkey in and cook it, you know. And the third thing they were giving away, I remember, was a Monarch Deluxe Bicycle. Woo! So, anyway, uh, they did this on Tuesday night, so I had, they, when you get your tickets, I had, I guess, Two or three hundred tickets. You get the beginning and the end, and there might be twenty tickets in, in, a, in a bunch when you got them. So anyway, I put, put a rubber band around them, and I wrote down from the beginning to the end of that uh, bunch of tickets, and, and so I could keep up with them. So and I put them in a marble sack, and uh, on on Buchanan Street, up at, at the, close to the uh, top of the street up there, the, the uh, Daisy and and uh, Grady Hancock lived there. And Daisy was a registered nurse at the Menden Hospital for years. And uh, they had a nephew that lived in Marinville, Louisiana. His name was George Lard, L-A-R-D. And I got to be good friends with George over the years. And so he'd come up. And so this was Tuesday night. I went up. I said, George, we need to go to the Rex Theater tonight. They're having a giveaway. Okay, Neil, we'll go. So 
We went to the Rex Theater and oh, I guess about seven, eight o'clock, they stopped the movie. Edgar Hands comes to that end, off stage, gets on the stage. They uh, have the uh, big container that they bring down there. Somebody pulls out a ticket and hands it to him. So they did that. Uh, this was the night they were giving away the bicycle, by the way. So they pulled out a ticket and they presented it to Mr. Hans. He reads it. Well, you got to wait and look around. Nothing. So he said, well, it looks like that's not a good ticket. So he said, let me, let me draw another ticket. So he, they drew another ticket out. He called out the number and my friend was looking at me. He said, Neil, Neil, that's your ticket. You've got that ticket. You've got to stand up, stand up. I said, oh, okay. So I stood up, you know, and I went down to the front. I, I didn't pull the ticket out at that time, but I told him I had it written down on this piece of paper. So he accepted that. He says, okay. So that, that was it. But he said, before I can give you the bicycle, I've got to go down to the Tower Theater. Because there might be somebody down there with that first ticket. And if they are, they will win the bicycle, not you. So I said, okay, so I waited. It must have been, seemed like forever for him to come back. So I waited out front with that bicycle. I wasn't going to let anything happen to it. That bicycle was half put together. The tires were half inflated. The seat was just barely on there. The handlebars were up and down. I don't know. I was determined. I was going to get it home anyway. It didn't make any difference to me. So anyway, Mr. Hans went down to the tower. He comes back after 15, 20 minutes, and I looked at him. I said, did I win a bicycle? I said, oh, boy. And the thing about that, that was a brand new bike. The week before, I had just bought a brand new Swin from Roy Fincher. So here I was. I'd been riding this bicycle all week. I had two bicycles there. My mother said, well, what are we going to do? So my other mother said, I think I'll call Roy Fincher and see if he'll take that bicycle back. So my mother calls Mr. Fincher. He said, yes, Ms. Baker, bring that bicycle back. I'll take it back and give you a full refund. So, Woo, that was good. We took the bicycle back, got our money back, and I had me this new swim ride around. So that, that was really something special, I think. And I'll, I'll never forget that. That had to be something very special, you know. And uh, there was another time back in, I believe, in 1951, the Menden High School Band got to go to Baton Rouge yes. to lead the inaugural parade of Robert F. Kennedy when he was inaugurated governor. Oh, that was a big thing. I remember that. 